Hey, we're going to start a new series. It's going to be a long series because we're going to put some meat on your ribs. Is that all right? I love Chinese food, but it don't stick very long. Yeah, it's kind of like eating a bowl of cereal. It tastes good, but it just don't stick and end up wanting another snack not too long after it. But in this series, it's going to stick with you because praying is one of our just main hubs of Christianity. Isn't it? One of the main pillars of Christianity is praying. Because uh, Christianity is all about a relationship with God through Jesus. And part of that relationship uh, is through prayer. It's the way we talk to God. It's the way we comm commune with Him. If you don't talk to Him, uh, you don't have much of a relationship. Isn't that right? And God made it where anybody, anywhere, anytime can talk to Him. He said all who call on His name can be saved if they want to be. Jesus said that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Isn't that right? But yet it's a place where very few people actually do it. There's a pastor, as uh, uh, David Yonggi Cho, Paul Yonggi Cho, I think they're brothers, in Seoul, Korea. It's the largest church in the world. I don't know how many they were up to now. Probably a million, I don't know. But the uh, biggest church in the world and uh, many Preachers uh, from America go there, try to figure out what in the world are they doing to get a million people going to their church, and uh, they win souls. That's, that's the first thing. Isn't that a big revelation? <laughs> big revelation. They win souls. But they pray. They pray. That's their biggest thing is they pray. And he said, you know, you American uh, pastors and you American churches, uh, y'all don't mind building great buildings. You don't mind having great music. Uh, you'll do all kinds of wonderful things musically and building-wise, and you'll support things, and you give money, and you do a lot of wonderful things. He said, but uh, Americans don't like to pray. Isn't that true? Everybody got quiet. How many of you just love to pray? You just get goosebumps, and whoo, when you talk to prayer, whoo, you talking about prayer. Whoo, exciting. See, none of you got excited right there. If you have trouble going to sleep, read your Bible to pray. One of them will put you to sleep, right? Because we're bored with it. The devil will see to it. You go to sleep praying or reading the Bible. One of the two will work. And it, it doesn't have to be that way. I said it doesn't have to be that way. Our relationship with God uh, is hinged on our prayer life. And so we need to develop no matter where you are in your stage of Christianity, whether you just got saved last week, today, or you've been saved for 50 years, we all need to pray. And we need to continue to pray. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Isn't that right? The Bible talks about walking in the Spirit. It literally means to walk at one with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that right? To be at one with him, to walk with him. He's in us, so we can walk with him as he's in us. And the Bible says, uh, as we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what it says. Galatians chapter 5. We will not fulfill the lust of the flesh if we walk at one with the Holy Spirit. That means in constant communion, praying without ceasing, walking in communion with the Holy Spirit and fellowship with the Lord through the Holy Spirit uh, because your mind, listen, if your mind ain't thinking about sin, uh, you're not going to sin. When your mind is on the Lord, the Bible says he'll keep perfect peace who keeps their mind on him. Tell your neighbor, I got the Lord on my mind this morning. You might be thinking about enchiladas and where we're going after church when he hushes, but the Lord is on my mind right now. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone. Man shall not live by spaghetti and tacos and enchiladas alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That's what we're to live by. In Him we live and move and have our being. Isn't that right? It's a relationship. It's a relationship, Dio. Praise God. And today we're going to talk about birthing a prayer movement. Oh, and silence filled the air. I said we're going to talk about birthing a prayer movement, not just a prayer meeting, but a prayer movement. How many believe we need a movement in this nation once again uh, with people praying? God's churches praying and his, his saints praying and talking to him. 
And I just want to challenge you today. I want to stir you up today that we need to stir ourselves up uh, to begin to pray and to take our prayer to another level. I'm preaching a whole lot better than you're letting on this morning. I said we need to take our prayer uh, to another level. Amen. All of us could use a, a stronger Holy Spirit movement and an anointing in our prayer time. I promise you all of us can. I've been born again since... Uh, July the 6th, 1987, I've prayed a few times. But I promise you there's more. There's more. Because our relationship with God is through prayer. It's kind of like church. You know, you go so long, you start just getting used to it and bored to it and immune to it. And that's probably the biggest thing, we get immune to it. We come, we sing some songs, we do announcements, and we have a sermon, and we're just numb to it because that's what we do because we're just like robots, and we come in and we sit and we sing, and you know we can do it all of it with everything else on our mind but whatever's going on. We, we've learned how to do it, and we all do it sometimes. You have to intentionally dial in. You have to intentionally focus. You ever, you ever started praying? And your mind was thinking about something else while your mouth was talking. You ever done that? I do it all the time still. I catch myself going through the motions of praying because I've prayed so much I know what to say. And so I'm talking to, I think I'm talking to God every day. And, but yet my mind's on this and on that and I forget where I was. And, oh, I'm sorry. Start over. Take two. Take ten. Take 12. Let's try this again. Focus. That's why God told us to go into a prayer closet where we can focus. And we all need that prayer closet alone. Shut the door. No phone, no dog, no kids, no husband, no wife, no nothing. Just me and God and I can focus. We all need that, and if you don't do it through, before this series is over, you're going to do it. Amen? I'm just going to speak it on you, prophesy it on you. You're going to do it in the name of Jesus before this thing is over because we need a movement of prayer in our hearts and our lives and in this church. We do, we do, we do, we do. Amen. Now, the series is really going to be on the Lord's Prayer, but today we're not going to talk about the Lord's Prayer. We're just going to talk about birthing a prayer movement. It's kind of your introduction to the Lord's Prayer. All right? Brother Ronnie's with me. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> There's a threefold progression to prayer. And we're going to look at that threefold progression today. Threefold progression. It's really a threefold progression to change. Anything you want to change, it, there's a threefold progression to, to change in anything. And since we need to change our, our prayer uh, life, our, our prayer that's in our life uh, in the birth of movement, we need to go through this threefold progression. The Bible tells us, in, and I'm going to quote this to you, Psalms 37, verse 4 to 5. Delight in the Lord. Delight in the Lord. The word delight means take pleasure. Take pleasure in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You ever heard that? Take pleasure in God. He'll give you the desires of your heart. As long as those desires don't contradict his will. Because some people have some unholy desires that he's not going to give you. But you already know that. Delight the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit. Woo, there's the big C nasty word right there that every Christian doesn't like to hear. Commit. Commit. If you date somebody long enough, they want you to commit. Isn't that right? <laughs> I've told you the story of Anna and I. We started dating. I liked her, so I didn't want to break up with her, and I kind of had a habit of, you know, I didn't like something about you too early on. I'd bail. I was a preacher, and I was nervous. So I just told her when we started, uh, let's just be friends and just go out on the weekends and stuff, you know. Right? I gave her the F word, friends. Let's just be friends. Don't have to hold hands, don't have to kiss and all that stuff. Let's just, you know, let's go out and be friends. How many young women love to hear that from a guy that they're interested in? Let's just be friends for now. <laughs> There's no commit in that whatsoever, is there? But she stuck around for, she kept sticking around. 
And the more she stuck around, the more I liked her. All of her friends and everybody in that church that knew we were dating for a long time said, you need to quit stringing that girl along and put a ring on that finger. You need to commit. I said, I'm not ready to commit, so hush. So they had this little ongoing thing where they, the little smart dogs would come along. You're just stringing her. You're just stringing her along. I'm like, you people aren't right. <laughs> commit. You know, many people hear the gospel of salvation and they want to go to heaven and they want Jesus. They want his forgiveness and all of those things. Yes, I want to go to heaven. Yes, 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 yes. Save me, baptize me, whatever. But then this commit thing comes along. Hmm, I got to live it. Living it is the commit, right? It's one thing to pray a prayer, God forgive me, baptize me. Yes, I want to go to heaven. Yes, yes, yes. I'll say yes, Lord. Yes, I want everything you got. Now I got to live it. Wow, that's a commitment to live it. That's the hard part, right? Living it. The easy part's getting saved and getting baptized and saying yes to God. Yes, I want forgiveness and I believe in you. Yes, yes, yes. But living it every single day. Whew, that's a little tougher, isn't it? Especially when you've got habits and things that are not godly and he's trying to draw you to his godliness and to himself and you're like... Ooh. I got my will and your will. You got your word, and then there's me, myself, and I, and there's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who am I going to follow today? It's usually me, right? But over time, we got to learn to start giving in and start following God. It's called commitment. God just doesn't want you to believe. He wants you to belong, and belonging happens through commitment. So we delight in the Lord. He'll give us the desires of our heart. We commit our ways into him. Trust also, and he will bring it to pass. All right. We're going to kind of take that scripture, break it down, change the order up a little bit. Um, the first one, first uh, progression in changing, the first progression in our prayer is this, desire. No matter what you need to change in your life, you have to have a desire to change. I think everybody in this room desires to pray and desires to pray more. That's a good desire. Desire is not enough to make it happen, but it's a good place to start. Wouldn't you agree? And it's okay to pray for God to give you a greater desire for himself. It's okay for you to ask God to give you a desire to pray and to pray more. It's kind of like you go to a restaurant and they have a menu. I like the menus that have pictures on them because then I can see what I'm going to eat. My wife, Anna, she gets irritated with me because if I go in a restaurant we ain't been in much, I'm kind of staring at everybody else's table and the waitress walking by what food's on there. I want to see what it looks like, Kim. Because it may not look like what I think it looks like. Okay, I don't want that now. Yeah, it mm. That enchilada's got different color sauce on it. Now. Mm. Anybody? Like to see it, visual. But when we see things visually, it can, it can whet our appetite a little bit. It can, it can stir up that desire a little bit. Well, that's how God is. That's why when we read his word, it stirs up a desire in us to know him more. When we hear his word, it stirs us up a little bit. Yes, I want more of that. I want more of God. Of course, it's better felt than tell. So when, we're, when we feel His presence and His Holy Spirit, we want more. Right? It's a good thing. Desire is a good thing for God. And it's okay to pray for more. In fact, we should pray for more. God, give me more desire for you. Give me a desire to pray. Put a, put a hunger in my heart to pray, God. But desire is just first gear. Mark 11, 24, 11, 24 says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray. Did you catch that? What are you desiring when you pray? That's what you're praying for, right? It's what you're asking God for. It's what you're thanking Him for. The things that you desire in your heart, you're praying over them. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. It starts with that desire. It all starts with a desire. What do you want? What do you want? When we get into the Lord's Prayer, you're going to see that, that God knows 
Your Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. God knows what you need. The question is, do you? Do you know what you want? Do you know what you need? Do you know what you're desiring when you pray? If you don't, uh, just hey, time out, start over. Start with a prayer. God, I don't even know what I want, but I want you. Give me a desire. What well, things, whoever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them. I heard a story of an evangelist. He told it himself many years ago. Very popular evangelist back in the 80s. Packed out arenas. 10, 10,000 kind of people you know. I mean, he's a popular guy. Dude's on TV every day. Great, great preacher. Great preacher. I mean, this guy can preach and uh, just, you know. And because he was an evangelist and he'd been to different towns and he rented, he, didn't, he went to churches sometimes, but sometimes when he would do his own crusades, he'd go rent out a big uh, a hall or an arena or whatever. Convention center. He'd go rent different places out. So he had his own group of people that he hired and that was working for him. And the committees, you know, that they did this and the music people did that. And the committee, they, they, but people organized the different parts of that event. All right? So he gets off a plane in this one city community he went to. His event coordinator comes to him. He's got a lady that got a little prayer team, you know. She comes to him. She says, I don't know if she called him pastor, evangelist, whatever she called him. Says, uh, we need to pray. We need to pray right now, desperately. He said, I ain't got time to pray. I'm busy. I got this going on, that going on, this going on, that going on. He said, you pray, I preach. That settles it. And he walked off. And, it, he, you know, the Holy Spirit kind of slapped him in the face because he realized what come out of his mouth. That sounds stupid, doesn't it? You pray, I preach. That's what he said. That's what was in his heart. I don't have time to pray. And, you know, those words haunted him. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will tell on you. All right? What you really believe, somebody push the right button's going to come out. Get you mad enough, you'll tell me what you really think about me. Holy Spirit wouldn't leave him alone. Convicted him. That's called conviction. Tossing and turning in that bed that night. Gosh, I can't believe I said that. Wow, that's stupid. But it woke him up. It woke him up so much that he changed uh, his prayer life. Because he realized he was so busy evangelizing and preaching and doing the work of the Lord and doing all this organizational stuff with his big meetings that he wasn't really praying very much. And he's a preacher. He's a good preacher. But he wasn't praying very much. Many preachers get burned out when they don't have a good prayer life. They're just word, 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 word. And they can do word, 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 but it's that prayer time with God that makes the difference. And then he was eventually mature enough and, smart and uh, mature enough, I guess, humble enough to tell everybody, hey, you know what? I used to be an idiot. I used to be so busy that I didn't hardly ever pray. Yeah. And him speaking that to that worker, Bonnie, it convicted him and, and started putting that man on his knees and got him to pray. Sometimes we, we don't word it the same way he did, but the same principle is there. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. None of us have a problem with saying a prayer. I don't think anybody in this room has a problem uttering a prayer to God. But as far as a daily prayer life and prayer time where you go into your closet, your private place, wherever you escape, and you just, you and God and pray, I would say there's probably people in this room who don't ever do that, but they say a prayer to God every now and then. God is calling you to uh, 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 birth a prayer movement in you today. Amen? He wants, he wants to know you more. And I know you want to know Him more. And that, that happens in the place of prayer. So go there. Get there. Tell your neighbor, oh, He's talking about you today. I know He is. <laughs> go there. Find you a place. Challenge yourself. If you're too busy... This is deep. Are you ready for this? Then you're just too busy. Oh, that, that, that was worth coming to church for, Rhonda, right there. If you're too busy to pray, you're just too busy. God should be first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else should be added to you. God said put him first. What do you think Jesus did? How many know Jesus is our example? 
What do you think Jesus did when he was on earth? He showed us how to live this Christian life, didn't he? He showed us how to have a relationship with the Father. Jesus always put the Father and his will first because he always put prayer first. I don't know if he did it every day, but there's times the Bible says that Jesus got up uh, long before uh, the daylight. And he would go and pray, whether it's in a garden, whether it was in a mountain, he would escape and he would go pray. Seeking God for direction for that day and talking to the Father. He never went and ministered. He never went and did a crusade before putting a lot of prayer on it. And Jesus is our example. If Jesus did it, how much more do we need it? Because I'm sure he heard a whole lot clearer than we do. I need a whole lot of spiritual Q-tips to, to hear. I'm tired. I need more coffee. Right? <laughs> desire. All right, number two. You have to have a desire. And you can pray for more. Desire has to turn into discipline. I said desire has to turn, has to form into discipline. That's that commit thing, remember? We've seen that in... Uh, Psalms chapter 37, commit your ways to the Lord. Discipline. Matthew chapter 26, verses 40 and 41. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Do you remember right before Jesus' death, he was preparing. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He was praying. He took, took three of the disciples with him. This is late at night. And he took them so far in there, and he said, y'all stay here. And he kind of went on. Even though they were with him in the permanent, he left and kind of went alone did, you know, and prayed over there. In agony where he sweat drops of blood. You remember that? And he comes back to them three different times. One time he comes back to them. Could you not keep watch with me for one hour? Could you not watch and pray with me for one hour? Then he tells them, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, that's the desire. The spirit's willing to pray. But the flesh gets tired. The flesh gets bored. The flesh thinks about other things. We have to keep this flesh disciplined to pray. Because the flesh doesn't want to. The flesh doesn't want to get up earlier. The flesh doesn't want to stay up later. The flesh doesn't want to uh, turn the TV off and go have a prayer meeting. The flesh, uh, flesh doesn't want to go to church when the church has a prayer meeting. Did you know the lowest attended things any church ever does is a prayer meeting? Did you know that? Three people, maybe five on a good, good night. Come on. We used to have prayer. It, we was running 125 years ago, had prayer meetings, and, and three people would show up. It was a weekly prayer meeting, three people every week out of 125. That's not good math. Could you not watch with me for one hour, Peter. Come on, Peter. One hour, man. This is, my life is hanging on this. I'm sweating drops of blood. And you can't even get you're sleeping. The church is sleeping today. Amen. Amen. Now I lay me down to sleep. <sighs> I was praying, but now I'm asleep. It's easy to do. Let me, let me help you with something. When God said, find your prayer closet, it doesn't have to be where your clothes are. It could be any closet, right? Be any room, any lone separate time with God. Let me help you. Let me help you with something. It's worth coming to church for, Ronnie, right here. Church on the bed is not your prayer closet. It'll put you to sleep. Sometimes I wake up before the alarm goes off. Good morning, Lord. Our Father, which art in heaven. Oh, yes, yes, our Father, our Father, our Father. Hello, Father. I get all the way to the coffee pot eventually, Debbie, and I'm still saying our Father, which art in heaven. Waiting on coffee. Coffee's done. Oh, yeah, 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 our, our father. Hey, father. <laughs> I started in bed. Fifteen minutes later, I'm still stumbling around to get to those first uttering words of addressing our father. It takes focus. And the bed will put you to sleep. It's not, it's not a good prayer closet. It's not a good prayer closet. Amen. Discipline. Psalm chapter 55, verse 17 says, Evening, morning, and noon, I will pray. Isn't that good? That's discipline. 
See, David is determined here. Evening, in the morning, at noon, I'm going to pray. He, he specifically, right there, he named three different times, I'm going to pray. And cry aloud, and God will hear my voice. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If any man will follow me, Jesus said, that's all of us, let him deny himself or herself. Deny. Deny doing what you would rather do than seeking God. Take up your cross daily. Put that thing to death and follow me. Any man come after me? Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. I mean, discipline is daily. You can discipline yourself once, but you need to be disciplined daily to follow the Lord and to pray. And it's, uh, it's, it has to go beyond a feeling. If you only do what you feel like, you're not going to live very good for God. Isn't that right? Because you don't always feel like it. Don't get stuck, Carol Burnett, with your feelings. Feelings. Everybody remember that song? Nothing more than feelings. Whoa, 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 feeling. Anybody? Yeah, feelings will mess you up. <laughs> Psalms 119, ver I'm sorry, Psalms 109, verse 4 says, I gave myself unto prayer. I give myself unto prayer. It's a commitment because I want to know God. That's discipline. It's discipline. You're not just going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, you know what, I think I'll pray today. It's discipline. You've got to make a decision, and you've got to follow that decision with a commitment. When you make a decision to follow Jesus, you've got to uh, follow that decision with a commitment. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's a decision. But actually doing it is another thing. That's commitment. Right? It's a commitment. All right, and then the third part of that progression of praying is when you desire turns into discipline, discipline will eventually turn into delight where you'll take pleasure in it. It takes time. I mean, no, love takes time. Love takes time. You can be infatuated with somebody. You're not in love with them. You're infatuated with them. You think they're cute. Let's just be honest. You might love their cuteness, but you don't know them yet to love them. Love takes time. It's the same with God. We need, and the greatest commandment is to love God with all of your heart, soul, and might. Well, that takes time because we don't know him. We know about him. All right? But the more we know about him and the more we try to get to know him, the more we can fall in love with him as, as our God, as our Father. It takes time. It's okay. Take pleasure in praying. It will come. That's the goal. The goal is when you can't wait for your next prayer meeting to see what God's going to do. You can't wait to get back to his presence because he's so holy and awesome. It's kind of like when you were young and you were dating. You couldn't wait to get, to get you didn't have a cell phone back then, to, to get home and get on that phone and just listen to each other breathe. <laughs> Till midnight, right? <laughs> I ain't even saying a whole lot of just, just breathing. Now you were wanting to do some breathing on your own. Go in your man cave. All right, Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. That's a decision that takes some discipline right there, isn't it? Early will I seek you. I'm going to put you first. I'm going to set that alarm clock earlier so that I can get up before I go to work and start my day off with you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, if you get up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, you know, I'm not suggesting you have to, to set your alarm clock for a whole hour because that's, I used to get up at 2.30. I used to get up at 3.30. That's asking a lot. And it's hard to pray at 2.30 in the morning. In 3.30 in the morning. But if you can do it, knock yourself out. But me, I would pray. But I don't know about this hour stuff. We got all day long to chat. But we'll start it at 3.30. How about that? Okay? Y'all just staring at me with that Sunday morning religious stare. Most of you don't get up at 4 something or 3 something. 
<laughs> but you can get up five minutes earlier. I mean, no, five minutes ain't going to kill nobody. Ten minutes ain't going to kill nobody. Half hour. God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. See, that's the desire right there. My soul thirsts for you. I delight in you. I take pleasure in wanting to know you and be with you. I thirst for that time with you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. That's today's modern church. It's so dry. It's dead. It's not like it used to be where the Spirit moved all the time. And I don't know why it's that way. Maybe it's because we don't pray like we used to pray. But let's be honest. The church is not like it used to be. You can call it what you want. The preacher says it's dead. It's, it, it's so much better than this. We're not there yet and we need to get back. Amen. Amen. You can take that little circle out. God start a revival with me and draw that circle around yourself and say, start it with me. Pour your spirit out on me and pour it out on our church in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't want to just go and sing a few songs and hear a sermon every week. We want your Holy Spirit there. We want the lost to be saved every week. Get the dust out of that baptism and put some water in it. Right. Amen. Amen. Get them Sunday school rooms back filled up making disciples again, Brother Jim. Amen. Go to two services and three services because we're getting so many people in the, in the church. Amen. Psalms 104, verse 34. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. That's delight, taking pleasure in him. Delight yourself in the Lord. Take pleasure in him. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Long to spend time with him. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus cautions us. We're going to shift gears here a little bit. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus cautions us to pray with the right motive. To pray with the right motive. I mean, a lot of people pray, they, they have wrong motives. We all do it. And when we do it, we need to check that. Check it. Make an adjustment. Our motives have to be pure. Our heart has to be right what we're praying for. <laughs> I used to have people years ago, I was associate pastor of this place, and we'd have people, they have these prayer meetings. Now, there's a lot more people come to them prayer meetings because we had 400 people. You might get 20, 25 of them. And some of them old sisters, brother, would gather around. They'd be mad at somebody. I mean mad at somebody. That's not usually a good time to pray when you're really mad at somebody because your motives probably aren't pure and holy. And I heard so much stuff like, whoo, check that one. Time out. Right? Hard to pray pure when you're mad because you're praying God get them prayers. You're going really Old Testament praying on them. Get them, kill them. Slap them, something. <laughs> Judge them. Cast them devils out of them. Jesus cautioned us. Birthing a prayer movement in our heart and in our church uh, needs to start with the right motive. Because we just want you and we just want to increase our relationship with you and we just want to be with you more. That's the good motive right there. I'm praying because I want to know you more and I want to have a closer walk with you. That's why we pray. Come on, somebody. That's why we pray. Relationship based. You're my father, I'm your son, I'm your daughter, and I want to know you, and I want to do this thing right and live right and touch people and do what you put me here on this earth to do. That's why we pray. The right motive. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, he didn't say if, did he? Jesus didn't say if you pray, if you pray. No, when you pray. You are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues on the street corner so that they will be seen by people. If you're praying to be seen, you got a wrong motive. 
If you leave this place and you go in a restaurant today and you're praying louder because you want the whole restaurant to hear you, you're praying to be seen. Not just embarrassing everybody at your table. You're praying really because you're wanting to be seen and you want that whole restaurant to hear you pray. In Jesus' name, bless this food, God, and everybody in this building. Can I, can I just throw a time out for a second, Kim? When you go to a restaurant, it's not the time to pray for the missionaries and Aunt Jojo and our dog at home that's not feeling well. You should have did that in your prayer closet. We're just blessing this food because we're hungry and we're ready to eat. So, you know, <laughs> bless the food and let's eat. Do your prayer time in your prayer closet and the dinner table is not your prayer closet. The food's getting cold. You're welcome. Everybody, you're welcome for that one. <laughs> and people say, gosh, that was quick, Dean. Yeah, I prayed this morning. You just asked me to say grace to that feed, and that's what we did. <laughs> they love to stand and pray in the synagogues on the street corner so that they will be seen. Truly, I say they have their reward in full. We're going to skip verse 6 because we're going to make it last verse 7. When you are praying, didn't say if. When you're praying, do not use thoughtless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. If you're praying to be heard, you got wrong motives. You don't pray to be seen. You don't pray to be heard. You pray to have a relationship with God. That's why you pray. If you're trying to worry about your King James speech when you're praying, you got wrong motives. You're thinking all wrong. Right? You ever heard people praying King James? Nobody. Thank you. I have to. I've probably done it myself. <laughs> Do not use thoughtless repetition. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. God knows your heart. And he hears you. It's not how long you pray. It's not how many times you repeat yourself. It's praying from the heart. Sometimes the shortest prayers of all is the one he might hear the most because you mean it, right? So verse 8, so do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Isn't that good? He already knows. Do you know? Check that motive. All right, now let's go back to verse 6. But as for you, when you pray, Go into your inner room. Close your door. Close your door. Find you a place to pray separate and shut the door. Shut all the noise out. Shut all the uh, distractions out. The dog, the kid, the phone. Turn the leap. leap. And that phone will get you in trouble. Turn that little computer thing you carry that you can't, that you're addicted to. Get. Uh, hmm? You need some face time with God, not with that phone. Amen. You get that all day long. Give him some face time in that secret place. Pray to your father who is in secret. When your father who sees what is done in secret, he rewards you. That time needs to be personal. It needs to be private. You got things that you don't share in a room like this and that you have a little talk with God about. It's important that you do it. Job chapter 2 verse 17 says, let the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. You ever heard that? Weep between the porch and the altar. The porch is public. Everybody sees your porch, all right? But the altar is more private. It represents more your private part of your life. We need to weep between that porch and that altar, between uh, our, our private life and our public ministry. God's called all of us to do something for him. But it starts at that prayer altar before it gets out on the front porch and goes public. Jesus always prayed privately before he ministered publicly, always. And he's called you to do the same. Find that inner room and pray to the Father in secret. Get your marching orders from him. Get your details from order him. Get your heart right with him in there. You've been hearing me say for a year and a half. 
We have to pray so that we have something to give when it is time to minister to somebody. We got to go to him and get filled up so that when it's time to pray for somebody, uh, we got something of spiritual substance to give them. Jesus always reached up before he reached out. That, I think that's what I said. You're gonna have that was the I don't know if that other thing was the long version of it. We have to reach up before we can reach out. Isn't that good? Yeah. Wesley, that's good. You got to reach up to God before you can reach out to people. That's called prayer. Jerry and Dee, you want to come help me? I'd say the worship team, but they're the only two here today. <laughs> God bless them, by the way. Thank them on their way up here. God bless you. It's hard. <laughs> Nothing else. It's hard when you don't have a drummer. It's hard. Especially when everybody's staring at you. Victories are always birthed in private before they're manifested in public, before they're demonstrated. Because Jesus is our example. Will you stand up with us today? Jesus is our example, and Jesus always prayed and sought the Father privately before he manifested the Spirit of God publicly. And friends, you and I are no different. We need God, we need more of Him, and we need to get along with Him so we can do what He's put us here on this.